fiber. I'm so happy that maple fiber came into my subdivision, tore up my yard. Terrorized everything. Yeah, I just, you know, destroyed it. Anyway, I think so. I think it's good. I thought they were all done. Um, I'll start by introducing these two gentlemen. Um, one of first, my name's Alan Mark. I know I think everybody in the room, superintendent of schools here in Raytown. Uh, and would be remiss not to introduce two of my board members that are here, Mr. Jerome Barnes, back here in the back that won in a landslide election this year. Wait a minute, nobody <laughs> made the Yeah, so, uh, landslide. We're calling it a landslide. <laughs> landslide like that. And, uh, Bobby's side, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Miss Bobby Salisbury right back here in the back on the Board of Education. We have uh, from Senate uh, uh, District 11, Senator Paul Lavota, and from uh, Representative uh, Tom McDonald from uh, District 28. And I thought what we could do today is they could kind of give you an idea of what's going on at the Capitol. We're certainly going to get the uh, opinions on the left side, but I know these guys well enough that they can give you opinions of what should be on the right. Uh, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so they're here to uh, uh, visit with us about that, and then I think they'll take some questions uh, and just kind of inform us. Uh, to this point. So with that, gentlemen, you can decide who wants to go first. Go ahead. So okay. I, your... I, I find it interesting, most of you are educators, right? None of you have sat in the front of the class. <laughs> you, hate, early. you hate it. You hate it when your students do that. It's like well, church. Well, no, I'm, I'm, uh, saying, uh, I'm State Senator Paul Lavoda. I represent the 11th Senatorial District. Just move out. Which is yeah, just scoot those chairs. Yes. Come yeah. close. Yeah. Which is uh, the 11th Senatorial District is, for the most part, independence, but it goes to the west to basically part of East Kansas City. It takes in the sports complex, cuts down the very top of Raytown and a little part of Lee Summit, and cuts back up to the east, and takes in Buckner and an unincorporated area. Um, so uh, I'm in my second year in the Senate. And uh, I'm trying to think what else background I can tell you. Um, I think the biggest issues that we're facing in Jefferson City, um, and I'd be, you guys came uh, on a Friday afternoon for a specific reason, so I'm, I'm really interested in your questions. But just to give you a highlight, I think the big issues that we're facing in Jefferson City is first the issue to fix the transfer law. Currently, an unaccredited district, the students that live there are able to go to a neighboring school district. Um, it has decimated the Normandy School District in the uh, St. Louis area, and I believe that we need a quick solution to uh, solve this problem. I introduced a bill that would uh, ask uh, school districts to set a classroom ratio and then submit that to DESE, and then based on that, they could take transfer students or not. Uh, based on did they meet their tra their uh, classroom ratio. That currently is a policy, but I want to make it part of statute because I think it's the quickest, fastest, easiest way to solve any type of transfer problem that we may have in our area with the Kansas City School District and potentially other districts. Um, I introduced that bill. I had a hearing on it last week in the Senate, the Education Committee. There are, I think, five or six other transfer bills that were uh, also heard. Um, those other bills included a lot of other um, things to handle unaccredited districts. Mine was simply to fix the transfer issue. Um, the chair of that committee decided to roll all these ideas together, create a committee substitute, and what they did yesterday is put things together, but they also put in a provision which is a voucher, which is would allow an unaccredited, in the unaccredited school district students to go to a private school, a non-religious private school, and have taxpayers pay for that. I don't like that provision at all, and that's why I had a simple bill to solve the problem, as opposed to the nonsense that happens in Jefferson City that hurts education, we get these things in there. So we'll see how this goes. I hope we can get rid of that provision and, and have a simple uh, solution. Um, the other, the other big issue, um, well, I mean, I have a bill for Medicaid expansion. I can answer questions about that. Um, increasing the minimum wage. But the other issue that I've been working on is the uh, same issue we dealt with last year. There was a, a bill that was passed that luckily was vetoed by the governor that was a massive tax cut. Massive tax cut 
for basically the higher brackets of, of income in the state. It would have taken away close to $800 million in our uh, revenue every year, which would make it even harder to fund the foundation formula, which isn't funded anyway. So it doesn't make sense to cut um, the top rates taxes and decimate the services that we have. Um, good news, the governor vetoed it. It was sustained. Bad news is we have a bill sponsored by Senator Krause in the Senate that's pending on the floor that is a $900 million bill. And uh, one in the House, I think you guys passed this week, is also a $900 million bill. The governor has some ideas on what a tax cut would look like. In my opinion, if we don't fund a foundation formula, then we shouldn't be talking about reducing revenue yet. Um, that's a uh, basic commitment that we should follow. So um, I'm steadfast against anything that doesn't do that. Um, so transfer, tax, and I'm sure something else will come up if you have questions. And now let me introduce Tom McDonald. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Re Representative Tom McDonald. I, I uh, represent District 28. It's roughly uh, begins at the stadium and goes south in a very straight line all the way down uh, Blue Ridge Cutoff um, to about 81st where Blue Ridge angles back to the west. My uh, district line continues on straight all the way to uh, the Raytown city limits and the Lee Summit, Edge Blee Summit on 87th. Goes straight east to a, a, a line that would be in, uh, pretty much in line with uh, uh, Norwood and then back um, east to 70. It's a perfectly square district. Very rare that you would find any district in the state that is, <laughs> yeah. that is a rectangle. Uh, I take in about 96% of Raytown and uh, about mm, 3,500 voters in uh, the Kansas City area, very few in Independence. Um, we were talking about uh, the transfer issue. Um, Paul has seen a number of bills through committees in um, the Senate. Um, there are a lot. There's a lot of activity in the in the House uh, committee rooms right now. However, we have not seen much action on the floor regarding educational or transfers right now. Um, I know there's a lot of stuff in the works, and uh, my problem is I keep that. I I leave that job to the educators when it's um, involved in committee. But um, the other day I had the opportunity to hear from a group of, of uh, educators, the administrators, and the students <coughs> of Normandy. And uh, they brought their issues to the State House and um, presented them in our caucus. And it was really difficult to listen to those people plead their case. They are just, they're the first school that's experiencing all this money, walking away from their educational system. Normandy's a very poor um, district in um, St. Louis, and uh, they came to ask for $5 million so they could keep their doors open through the remainder of the year. The odds, I guess, are about a 50-50 shot that they would receive that funding so they can continue on. Those kids were devastated. You know, I, they saw a big portion of their friends walk away. I think we talked about 12 to 15 percent of the student body took the opportunity to uh, move to a different accredited school. Uh, they left uh, a giant hole in funding, and uh, the school probably will not be able to open its doors next year at all. Uh, it'll have to enter uh, or leave a $5 million deficit in their budget. Uh, and uh, the question is, where does it go from there? What happens to the next school that becomes unaccredited? It's uh, a ripple effect that is going to be tough to stop. We have to come up with a good solution to put these kids back in place. Um, I think Dr. Markley and I are pretty much on the same page about how we should handle the local issue. Um, you know, it's not about vouchers, it's about uh, keeping these kids in a place where they want to be. And uh, um, the only answer I can see to any of that is maintaining all the physical plants and giving uh, 
the responsibility of picking those up and getting back to accreditation to people who can manage that type of business. So, um, other things that are going around the state house, um, the the tax issue is another one. It, it kind of is joined hand in hand with education. Uh, the Senate has seen one version. Apparently, it has uh, called out um, or cut out, carved out a spot for education. Is that true? Uh, Senator Cross. Well, has, uh, he and the there governor. was a there was a uh, a press event where the governor talked about an idea that Senator Cross and him may work on. Um, the we'll House version bill has nothing like that. Um, Representative T.J. Barry is carrying that on the House side. And um, it's basically going to leave a, a billion dollar hole in the, the budget. And, uh, you know, the most vulnerable are the ones that give. I, I think education is probably at the front line. Health care is obviously at the front line. Services for the elderly will be the ones that go down. Um, they'll take the biggest portion of that hit. So uh, we're getting... That bill is right at the front. It's going to come up on the House floor probably next week, and uh, it's going to be an interesting battle. It stands every chance of probably uh, passing the House. And, um, the House and Senate bills will cross, and um, one way or another, I think one of those is going to uh, be passed into law. Of course, the, really the good thing I see is uh, the governor's managed to take away um, the veto-proof majority through a number of different, uh, he did it really through appointments. Um, uh, so there's no veto-proof right at the moment until they uh, have special elections to refill those seats. And um, at this point, uh, a red pin looks like it will stick. So that's the other option. If it passes through, uh, it will never pass the governor's muster. Um, I have to stop and think what else is going on. Um, what would you, what do we talk about this morning, Dr. Markley? Yeah. What am I? This is, I've forgotten it already. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we talked about uh, on the transfer just to, uh, let's go to the tax bill since that's what you want. The Senator Brown's bill, and I was part of those conversations with what we can do to, to get the education establishment to support that. And it would be what Senator Lobota said, and that is, to uh, fully fund the formula before it kicks in. Uh, that that would get the support. We know in education that we have to compromise on some things, but we can't compromise on that. We also talked about this morning that, and, and we'll say it in here, I think we can because it's it's out in the media, uh, the strong army of representatives, particularly on the Republican side, uh, that stood with the governor and with education last year and voted not to override his veto. They count votes in caucus, uh, and they know who those folks are, and they know we're in election year uh, in 2014 in November, and we know that um, there will be threats made that uh, if you didn't have someone in your primary, there will be uh, in your primary. I think uh, when the, the filing starts, March the 5th or something like Tuesday. that. Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. Uh, and it go, runs through most of March. Um, so there's an uphill battle there. Uh, it would be easy if we could sit down at the table and say, uh, let's come to, to terms on this thing. The one thing about Krause's bill that the Senate's tried to do over the years, particularly since Will's been in there, and that's get a, get a, uh, uh, a hand or a control of tax credits in this state. And the Senate's been willing to do that, uh, whereas the House has not. Uh, and that's part of, the, part of the governor's plan is to cut back on some of these tax credits uh, because again, we're experimenting that we assume that business is going to blossom and revenues are going to increase and we won't need to worry about funding the formula because it's going to be funded with all this new money that we're going to have. Um, you know, we can argue that point. On the transfer bill, there's, like they said, there's many bills that are there. Uh, the, the bill out of the Senate's being carried by Senator Pierce. And just to back up a little bit, this week the state board uh, heard a plan from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education of what to do with unaccredited schools. And we're still trying to go through it uh, and, and see what it means. 
but I will tell you that they, they didn't go with the plan that was, uh, was uh, funded by the Halls and Kaufmans. Uh, they took some of, the, some of the ideas that the superintendents came up with, uh, and they've taken some, some of the ideas that's out of the Kansas City, Missouri plan that they submitted. Uh, it's a starting point. It looks less punitive than it is, uh, has been in the past, and the reason I say that is they have included interventions at the state level, which we haven't seen in the last three years. I explained to a group today that there was a time when we would go through the MSIP process and there would be teams of our peers or colleagues in education that would come from other districts as a team with DESE support and review your school district and uh, tell you what you're doing right and tell you what you're doing wrong and you create an improvement plan and you follow through on it. That hasn't happened in the last three years for whatever reason, be funding, lack of people. So with that being said, that's a good thing in this plan, but they didn't go as far as stopping the transfer. They could have done provisional certification for Kansas City, who earned the points to be provisionally accredited, uh, but they did not do that. And it wouldn't have helped the St. Louis side because uh, they, are, they are unaccredited and don't have the points as well. So um, we have to do something. They left it in the hands of the legislatures. And the bills that are out there, things that, that worry me, uh, and it worried us to the point that we took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, and that was the basis of an unfunded mandate. They're going to put the, both bills have a cap on the tuition. Put aside the, the uh, voucher thing, which that's something we would certainly impose. But they put a cap on the tuition that we could receive. And the reason being is that some St. Louis schools, I like Clayton and would do, Clayton is charging $20,000 per pupil, okay? Uh, we don't do that, obviously, in Raytown, but, but we have figured what it would take to educate a child that's come over maybe two grades behind in reading and in math. They might be a special education student and they're, they're also living in poverty. All these different at-risk things that we have, to, that we have to, to take into account to get a student on the right track costs money. We know that because we experience that every day. So to cap tuition, I think the rate's like $7,000. I think that's what Streams bill is um, Representative Stream, who's chair of the House uh, Budget Appropriations. That's what his bill is calling for. Seven, that the Raytown taxpayers don't need to supplement uh, uh, dollars to educate students that are coming from unaccredited districts when that money's meant to be spent on the students that live here. Okay, So that was the whole reason we took this thing all the way uh, up to the Supreme Court. So those are the things that we have to watch out for that we're not going to support as an education establishment. And whether it passes, you know, if it doesn't pass, then we may be having the same conversation again next year. But we do support the capacity side of things and being able to set the capacity because we know what class size to, student, to teachers does for education and achievement. So um, that's some of the things that we talked about this morning. Uh, the tax bill. Um, just to reiterate again, we were willing to compromise on some things. Just like a few years ago, we were willing to compromise on open enrollment bills because we kept getting those every year. Jane Cunningham was famous for sponsoring those bills, open enrollment bills. And sooner or later, you know, to get something you don't want, you better learn to get something that you can live with. And uh, I think that's something that, that, that I can't speak for the entire education establishment. But something certainly we would be willing to do is sit down because we want to grow the economy just like anybody else. We know what it means, a vibrant uh, economy in our community, what it can do not only for uh, schools, uh, but just for the, the community as a whole, whether it be more opportunities for community events or community support, to repaving the roads in this town, those kind of things. We're, we're, you kind of get tired of coming out against everything. So you want to you want to come out and support us some things, but then again, you can't sell your soul uh, in some instances, and this is one of those that we just can't. So you asked, and I took 15 oh. minutes to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll just add that you know the house side is I think off to an uncomfortably slow start. Uh, I thought it was bad last year, but it just does not seem to be moving much at all. It's an election year. Um, Things change a little bit when it becomes in the election year side. And uh, so you see a shift in uh, the way some people think. Um, but uh, I want to know why there's nothing moving. And the popular belief is that uh, 
it's, there's a lot of the, the uh, controversial legislation that's going to be held until after filing closes, and then it'll come to the floor. Uh, it's just kind of being dammed up, and I think they'll open the gates and we'll just fly through it. I mean, there won't be any serious discussion about most of it. Do you want to introduce this sweet lady that walked in right here? <laughs> Well, you think sweet? Oh boy! Most, most of the time, I think. this is a lady. This is a lady. This is Representative Bonnie Mims, and she has a portion of Freetown on the very uh, southwest corner. So, and an excellent, good friend, excellent legislator, and uh, she really has the inside story on everything. Well, I have to read, and I spend a lot of time with the superintendents. Well. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you tell your little story about a bit about what's really going on at the state level. You mean the senator already done done our part? He, he was. He uh, did his little spot. Yeah. Uh, and you handled the stuff about Desi. No. Uh, or, say, at, say what you think is important to you. Um, at this point, I'm, first of all, I apologize for being late. But I was over in Hickman Mills, uh, going through the same thing that you all are doing right now sharing the views on what's going on. A lot of our bills that we have as Democrats are held up, so they're not letting anything through. So uh, I've got three out and they're just sitting. So just as Tom was saying, it's going to take some time for it to go through. Uh, I'm sitting on Joint Commission of Education and Higher Ed. Uh, at this point, basically the colleges have been pretty much talking about how much funding they need. And we're talking about what's needed for the rest of our school districts so, and looking at the cost, look at the savings. And so after looking at the 44.1 million that has been left out and how to get that back into the budget, uh, that's a shortfall for the school districts. So um, I'm again, I, again, I'm pretty much right behind the senator, or should I say the side of the senator, especially with the views from Desi. I really feel like um, I'm not a thrilled person about C Trust. I'm not trusting anything that they have <coughs> at this point. Um, then I forgot to say that I'm a school board member too. So uh, you get to see the inside piece. It's what we're going through, just making sure that we educate our children. Then when you have all the other children that are coming from everywhere else, you got to stop and you got to put mentors in place. You got to put a whole lot of things in process for them to be able to bring up to your children that have started from uh, early childhood up. In the Hickman Mills District, we have an early childhood school building. Now we're opening it up for 600 kids and for all day. So uh, last night at the board meeting, they were screaming about you know how we're going to have these teachers and uh, not being able to raise the salaries. My thing was basically being able to keep the teachers that we had and maintain a salary because at one time we had to borrow money to keep the doors open. And people don't realize the seriousness of it. And I was the board president at that time, which made it very difficult because we had to merge the two high schools together. So uh, in doing that, and I said, which one would you prefer I do at that particular time was give you a raise or because if we give a raise, you got to <coughs> or maintain what we have. And so we did the maintain. Now with all these other things that are added to you, when, and we're provisional. So then looking at what's happening with the undercredited system is making it very difficult. So it's basically what happens in Kansas City is a domino effect to everybody. And then I'm going to say because I can go on and on. But I'm losing my throat at this moment because it's been going all day. <laughs> Questions? Pastor Dunn, I'm going to represent one break of water here. Oh, it's just that I've been talking. I've been with the, with the board and the superintendent. And, we changed bus services, so that's been another thing. I think you need something else. I was going to say. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and that was, a, that was a big fiasco for us last night. We changed our bus school bus company last night, and which saved us a half a million dollars. And uh, as all the time, the problems that we were having, I was asking to hear from the bus drivers, where the videos on the bus, because the buses were being stopped in the middle street and just left with kids on it, you know, they just were fed up. But you don't have anything to back up how you press these charges. I mean, if you got children jumping on a bus driver, you know, you're just not just going to let it happen. And you never got anything straightened out. So we changed services. And that was a tough decision after 18 years. But we had to do it. 
And of course, you know who led the charge. Anybody got anything? Yeah, for I just had. My, I'm just thinking. I was listening to the story that you shared about the kids uh, and, and the teachers and everyone trying to get five. $500 million to continue the year out. And then I think about what is going on with uh, Kansas City Public Schools. I, it appears that there is no intent here to try to help this district, but more of an intent to, to, uh, to break it down, to dissolve it, to make it no more. And so if that is a domino effect, then what, you, the, what is happening is that somebody in making these decisions really don't care about what happens to the kids, because if there was some form of care there, it would seem that they would avoid destroying the school. If it has made, it has reached a provisional, it would seem like we would work hard to make them better, not destroy them, because they're, whatever happens in Kansas City is going to affect all of the districts. And most of all that's going to get hurt are the children, because see, you're uprooting them out of a place where they're comfortable or where they are familiar, and putting them in an environment where they have to relearn, not only do they have to learn uh, the environment, the culture, but also if they're below the standard that they're going to, you're creating hardships. And I don't know who's making all these decisions, but really they need to come out to some of the meetings and, and start having meetings with the, with the parents and with the administrators and all of those people that are in Kansas City Public Schools so that they can find out that their decision is going to be very damaging to this district and not just Kansas City Public School but to all of the districts around it. Well I, I, I think you're exactly right what's going on. I think there's a it's not a coincidence it is a plot well, by, we by, this? by the commissioner the current education commissioner to move our education policy to where we're getting rid of districts and we're bringing in charter schools and the right. like. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. She, her, her inaction, her lack of honesty, her um, um, deceitfulness. Yeah, deceitfulness, and her plans have shown that. I've been pretty clear with um, that she needs to go. I've worked on the gubernatorial appointments committee that we put three new people on there. Uh, when they came to me and the other senators, it was, you gotta get rid of this person. Um, they said we will, we will work in that in that for that goal. Um, so the fact that we have three, we have Dr. Martin, who was a former superintendent of Grandview Schools, and I think he was an intern in Kansas City. He, it's good that he's on the board now. Um, I think he'll, he'll be fair for our area. But you know, you look at these things, you see why is this happening, and your first thing is well circumstances. And your next thing is, well, maybe it's incompetence. Third thing is it's a plot. And that's what I think it is. I think it's specifically, you know, how, how do you have a new uh, criteria for the schools in MSET 5 and then change the numbers or change the way that you get there and then continually have a general assembly that doesn't fund a foundation formula? So we're not only asking you to get out to a higher level, we're giving you less resources to do it. And then when Kansas City works very hard to be provisional, they don't make them provisional because, well, we did that with MSEP 4, but we don't do that with MSEP 5. I mean, that's just a simple kick in the face of the hardworking people in Kansas City who have been trying to help these kids who are poor, who don't have the best home lives as we know, but you guys deal with the same issues here in Raytown that and, and Independence does too, Fort Osage does too, how to deal with poverty. Um, and we need a density that helps us. And that's why I had that bill to just to quickly fix that transfer. And um, that's what I'll keep pushing for. You got me on my soapbox. I'm going to finish with the, the back on what he's saying. Let's go back a little bit when they had the superintendent before this one who closed all the home schools. When, and my whole piece was when you close out that many schools in a neighborhood, yeah. the neighborhood starts to die out. Mm -hmm. So you, when you go back and look at that, you knew there was some problems starting right there. Then when the, they did that, and as the senator was saying, it was money, it was politics under the table, there was dirty money under the table, and then they got caught. 
And in the midst of getting caught, as the letter that he had started out with, the senator did and said, uh, we're not having this. And then you bring in a company to tell you about the school district. When you got people right here can tell you that was born and bred and raised in here. That, and then you have educators here that can tell you what's going on. Now you can bring somebody in to tell you about me, but I can tell you all about me. Which some of them might not want to know, but the point of it is, the t you know what I'm saying? And then the other thing that I struggle with is every when I hear the conversation and they keep putting it on free and reduced lunch and, and poor and poverty, I grew up in there. I went to school there, and I don't think that parents and teachers did a bad job with me. And as I share, I may be a psychotic, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> so when you look at it, and, and again, I'm just going to say, I, and I, I remembered your face, too. You see me look at your picture, Ms. Osbury, because you be hitting me with some questions. But when I look at uh, I think we're going backwards, and I'm not looking at, I, I'm looking at segregation piece. I look at, when you take them out of the element, and that's just like me, I didn't know we were poor. You couldn't have made me believe that. But then when I got out of where I was raised and going off to college and stuff, I didn't know what that, you know, what that was. So when you send them someplace that they're not going to be welcomed, or they're not going to be treated fair. And just to show you just a tidbit of, I looked at Dr. Green come in and as, the senator, and I keep wanting to say Paul, <laughs> but Paul was fighting and fighting and fighting and then the senator from St. Louis and they were fighting and fighting and fighting and then he said, I'm writing a letter, are you with me? And I, I told him, I said, well, no, but then when I got to the letter, excuse me, the girl said, no, me. <laughs> it wasn't good. And I went, oh, excuse my French, hell yes, I'm sign me on that letter. Mm -hmm. Because what happened was, in the Hickman Mill School District, I had said before the commissioner, and I was saying to her, you just took our two points, but you knew these kids just moved in right in the middle of testing. And we were going, you know what she said to me? Well, you didn't have no other choice now. I'm showing just how she did it, but to take them. So I said, so you punished me instead of rewarding us with the fact that we're trying to bring them up to par? So I literally sat there in tears, I really did. And at that point, I said, she's not willing to hear anything we have to say. Now, after that, less than eight months later, I become the state rep, and my first phone call was from the commissioner. We need to sit down and talk. I'm done. See, you done treated me that way on this level, now you got to deal with me up here, <laughs> and we want you want to talk. So I said, okay, well, we're gonna talk. So I shared what I did. I called all my superintendents, and I want to know their thoughts. So I started sharing, do you know what you just did? And then that's when I realized the money that had been put in somebody's pocket to tear that district up, to turn it into charter schools. And I said, that is one of the largest districts. Why would you do that? Which, if you pay attention to some of the things that's happened, banished them all, which was the pulse to all of us. Okay, when that, went, when that folded, look what happened to all of us. Okay, now we got Sarna coming into there. But the same with the school district. You tear it up, what? And some of these people that are making decisions, I don't think they have a clue. It's like, well, let's have little entities here, and uh, every one of these schools will have a uh, school board and a SAB board. And I said, do you realize this is bigger than what you all are looking at? And some of them I'm looking at is about contracts. It's not about educating kids. Far from it. So I just want to share that's where I come from with it. What, do you all have support uh, for, you have support, uh, Senator Paul, for your, your <coughs> transfer, for the, the changing of the number of students in, in classes? Well, uh, there's, I would say that almost everybody in the Senate supports that idea. Where when we get into the trouble, which was, disheartened to me yesterday was, as we put these other ideas, other people will put their education ideas on there as well. And one is that voucher that I mentioned. Well, if you're going to do that, well then basically you're doing the same thing. What, what has been encouraging about this crisis is that, if you call it that, is that the area superintendents have banded together and looked at things from a community. Your superintendent, he's here. 
Independence, Fort Osage, all the areas that I represent, and Dr. Green got together, and it was never a, well, we're in the suburban areas, we don't want your kids. It was, how can we help you right. not be abandoned? Because if we think from a receiving district that we're going to get hit with some financial things, we will. But that's going to decimate the Kansas City School District. And the problem I have with the voucher is that it would do the same thing. You're going to take money out and put them to another school. <coughs> take, take the kids who have either the direction or the, the guidance to go to another school, take them out with the money, and the kids who need the extra help are still going to be abandoned. And that's, that's terrible for those kids, and it's terrible for our community. It's terrible for our state. And um, so there's good ideas, there are the ideas of fixing this transfer thing is there, but you're going to throw these things in there too. Or um, the other idea that was tried to throw on there but didn't happen is get rid of teacher tenure. You know, that has nothing to do with it. That's what happens in Jefferson City. We, get, uh, we lack uh, a sense of trying to solve the problem. The, not us. Us Jackson County people are direct descendants of plain spoken Harry Truman and we like to just go and solve the problem, but we have to deal with the rest of the state. It's tough. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> What can the community do? I mean, are there things that the community can do to the help community? You all or? Yes. What can we do? Stay on top of the issues. You continue to let your voices be heard. Um, I set to 10, 11, 12 o'clock some nights responding to all the emails that are sent to me, all the letters that are sent to me. I even put them in a folder. So I, when I do speak, I speak as what was sent to me. This is what comes from my constituents. So, um, again, until so she's removed. Um, I, I would say specifically, and, and um, Salisbury used specifically in this, but the whole community do this. When you have, I don't want to be picked on the spot, Dr. Parkley, but when you have a superintendent who has enough courage to publicly say, hey, that commissioner's not doing the right thing and we need some changes, you got to support them. And, and I know you mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And I also know that the other... Where's Mr. Mr. Barnes? I do know also that if your superintendent wasn't doing the right thing, you would pull him in the woodshed and make sure he did. I mean, that's you're here for the kids. So when, when, they, do, when they do the courageous thing, to make sure that you're really doing that, and the rest of the community should do the same. I remember one time when I was superintendent, and I was blown away when I watched them. I'm trying to remember, Alan. And when they all came together, and it was a press conference. Not one superintendent was missing. Or we have one, now I take that back, we have one, but there was a representative there for that district. But they band together, and I can't remember what it was about. And they did a press conference. That's the kind of stuff that the community needs to see, to see them all together. And then see all them school board members together, band together. Mike? Yeah. The thing that kind of bothers me, and maybe you, you could give me some information, is I don't think the track record of the charter schools in the Kansas City area is better than the public school. It's not. It's not. So it doesn't seem like that's a solution, is it? No. But somebody wants it, though. Sure. Money. 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 Okay. It is money. You know, I'll just finish. It, everyone knows it's proven fact that when schools go away, neighborhoods dry up and communities dry up. And uh, so. We're not only in a fight for good education, we're in a fight to save our community. And uh, uh, I'm putting a lot of expectation and a lot of hope in uh, our governor to uh, <coughs> fix the education issue, drag Desi into some sort of respectable shape. Um, fully fund the formula like he promised he was going to do in the next three years and uh, end off this tax, crazy tax thing that's going to just decimate uh, funding for our schools across the entire state. So um, the governor's red pen is going to mean a lot this year, I mean an awful lot. And, uh, he needs to stand firm on some of this stuff, uh, no deals on taxes. Um, I can't see that. I have a question. You spoke about the um, 
banding together the superintendents on the Kansas City side with the, the surrounding districts. Is that happening on the St. Louis side with the district that is in turmoil? And are they? Can you tell me this? I can speak to that. When we came together to create that plan, it was between Kansas City superintendents and St. Louis superintendents. Oh, well, okay. That hasn't happened before. No. It's almost well, like uh, there's a divide right. uh, between the, even when I was in Southwest Missouri, uh, the Southwest Missouri superintendents and the Kansas City superintendents converged, but St. Louis was almost like their home country. Mm -hmm. And this issue has brought uh, that group together uh, because it's a statewide issue. One right. on it seems almost like a forced consolidation of school districts is what, what it seems. And the way that happens is they go bankrupt and they lapse and they're absorbed by other school districts. It's happened the last time it happened was with Wellston. And where did all the students from Wellston go? They went to Normandy and Riverview, are now unaccredited. And it's a perpetuating problem uh, that's going to occur that could very well happen in our region as well. So, um, if your conspiracy theories that you talk about up there and the plots, I believe that's that's a plot from the right, uh, on the right side. And you know, there's days that I'm a Republican just as much as I am a Democrat, you know, because I'm self-serving on what benefits me and my cause the most. But uh, but that's what it seems like, what it feels like. And there's always, and some may argue that well, you got 521 school districts in the state of Missouri. Stead up here has 60 what five kids, 64 kids. I think, and it's a school district, and I'm not saying they need to be consolidated, but maybe it's something we have to look at, but this is something that, it's a tidal wave that's, uh, that may be impossible to stop once it gets started. I think rural representation is kind of coming into line. But, you know, this, two years ago, they, they just viewed this as a city issue, mm -hmm. and, um, St. Louis, Kansas City problem, and they weren't too concerned about it, but I think everybody's getting the idea that the dominoes are going to start to fall there. In three years, once they start, it's in three years there will be 70 unaccredited or provisional school district as opposed to the 15 or 16 there are now. In seven years, under the new MSIP 5 guidelines, Blue Springs will be unaccredited. Blue Springs, the highest math scores in the state, uh, just the way the rubric is created, they can't grow anymore and it's, it becomes punitive. So that's all <coughs> the way that was created. You know, we talk about how can we do some things, and we've talked about this. We never really want the legislature, legislature to get involved in a whole lot of education issues and passing that, like these uh, three individuals up here said, we'll, let's leave that up to the edu education folks. But there comes a time when, uh, particularly MSIP 5 and, and the rubric that's accompanying it, maybe it's if we can't do anything as by banding together, uh, and influencing, maybe it's time some of these things that are pushed out of our government agencies like DESE go before uh, JCAR, which is a legislative rulemaking authority, uh, and a much more strenuous uh, examination of some of the uh, regulations and policies that are coming. I, de I support that, and I'm on JCAR. <laughs> it is, is another part of it, but you know, when we were in, our, when we were in a meeting, when Dr. Kinder the superintendent of Blue Springs said, if we, if all of our schools, kind of paraphrasing, if all the schools in Missouri were in Kansas, there would not be an unaccredited district at all. So you can see where the level has is jumped up so much that we have ended up having un, uh, unaccredited districts. And then we refer to them as failing districts when we keep pushing the bar up and keep keeping the resources lower. I mean, it's, it's, it's fundamentally unfair and doesn't actually educate any kids at all. You know, and that's, that's the real frustrating part of it. Um, part of my bill um, for transfer was that, and the other thing I had in there was that the state school board could not make a decision to unaccredited district if there wasn't someone on the school board from that congressional district. We haven't, for a year, had anyone from the Congressional 5th District. Right. I mean, that's just amazing. So that just shows me that the commissioner was doing as she needed to be. Okay. And I'm, I spent quite a bit of time on these three new folks that are in there. And I think they will help keep, I mean, that's how they need to be keeping um, accountable. Just, just like those of you, like 
I keep talking to you, in Salisbury, but <laughs> just like you do with your superintendent, you know, just the board is the final accountability education, and we need that more. So. And I also found something similar too, because um, the board is. And I said this last night in our board meeting was my job is policies and procedures. And there was an issue uh, at that point about the plan, the strategic plan Dr. Carpenter had. And one of the board members wanted to tell him what to do, how to do it, but no, 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 no. And this is exactly how he said, that's not our job. My job is to give him the tools to work with. He's the educator. Let him handle that. Now, what you need to be doing right about now is looking at this plan. Have you read it? Yes, I've read it. And this is where we vote and allow the educators to do it. But the diff, the piece, I'm, I'm like Paul at this point. And I've had a lot of them say, oh, no, she don't need to be running for school board anymore. She just needs to go on and stay in the legislation. But then I had one of our senior members in the community say, no, that's our problem because we're disjointed. Everybody should have somebody they can reach in the legislation, in the House and in the Senate, that they should be able to pick their phone up and say, we need help or we need this. And I was shocked because this lady is 93 years old and she came in that meeting because she had something she wanted to say and she said, young lady, I want you here. And I was like, yes ma'am, what could I say? Yes ma'am, right here. And she said, and I, and she walked right up and she said, I need your telephone number and I want that cell number. I was like, yes ma'am. I sure did, I gave it to her. But that was important to her and to me to see this 90 plus lady come out and she said, we need to be connected to you all. And so I, I, I was pleased to see that. And uh, I'm definitely making sure, because I always make sure I keep everybody that I get an email address from in a loop on what the uh, newsletter has to say. And that newsletter is not about me, because uh, your superintendent can tell you, because I'll say I got a corner each month. It's a different piece for the superintendents, because I got a little bit of Raytown, Hickman Mills, and Kansas City. And I focus what they want in there, you know, or from the community. You know. So I have a, a gentleman that's almost 100 years old, and I said, well, he's seen me. The only person I know, the eldest uh, was a World War II person, and it was his birthday. So that newsletter is to share what's going on in, in my community, not about me. So yeah, I, I do that too, to keep you up on what the bills are, and take it out there that way. Now, don't ask me to come out there and try to do a text. I'm just learning that my granddaughter is <laughs> going to be I'm not that good as yet. Any other questions for anybody? Anything else from the scene? Well, we were happy with, I mean, I think primarily everyone here is in the education field, but is there any other non-education? Well, I would, so, I would, can, I would contend that everything is education, but what? That would be me, probably. Any questions? Any yeah. else? No, I'm good. Yeah. He's shy. Okay. He's a, the bond is one bond issue coach here. So. Oh, He's an education guy. I don't want to lie to you. <laughs> but I, I think the starting point is, is supporting um, those who are calling to fix this problem. Just support those folks. Just call them. Call them and say good job or you need to. You know, what's interesting about it is that, I mean, this, the Missouri Senate is very much behind fixing the transfer issue. It's the nonsense that we may get in the bill. I think the majority, tell me if I'm wrong, representatives, the majority of, if not all the representatives from this area are ready to fix it. But then you have a speaker who may not be. That's so. That's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And, and, you know, we talk about, we're all Democrats, but talk about the partisan, but I think all the Republicans in this area are going to fix it as well. Sure. Um, Did they ever go to the schools and see them sales this morning? Just who? Because, I mean, you're going to fix something. It looks like you need to be in there to see what's going on. Personally, how can you make decisions? I know, I know you gather the data from people and, mm -hmm. and information. Well, but then, I mean, when it's so crucial the way it is and how it's affecting the communities and everything, I'm thinking you may need to. Just, I just think about myself. In order for me to learn something, I need to get up there and be a part of it. 
I do, and I go, well, and I share that. Mm -hmm. For those that cannot go into the schools, and then there's some they won't let you into the schools. I always notify the superintendents, but I don't let the teachers know I'm coming, you know, because I want to see what you really like in action. Well, so. and I can tell you, I have Independence, Fort Osage, Kansas City, Raytown, Blue Springs. I think maybe a little bit of right of the Lee Summit School District. So I need you to tell me That's what's right. going on. You know what I mean? I, I, I try to be around as much as I can, but, you know. And, and also, another, uh, Raytown is interesting. I don't know if you guys know this, but since redistricting, you have one rep, basically, but you have three senators now. And Santa Cruz has the most of, of there, and you have a champion in education in her, for sure. So you just, just keep telling, just keep telling, but it's, if we can't get to every school and see these issues, oh, no. we got to be open to it. We got to be open to what you have to say. No, you know what I mean? And represent, I mean, not representative. Ms. Hallsberry, mm -hmm. I know something we have to get back to also. At one time, we used to, as board members, used to meet quarterly. And I don't know if they stopped joining. I think we all probably need to go back because at one time it was, uh, oh, Alan left the room. It was Grandview, Hickman. Center, and I think it was Raytown, just a little bit. And then we invited Kansas City to join us, and then it just stopped. Because I think if all the board members are knowing what's going on, and they'll be able to. Well, Dr. Martin, Martin is very good. Uh -huh. uh, I commend him because he is very good at keeping us abreast of the things that are legislatively going on, especially with the things that have been going on with Kansas City, Missouri School District, and. Also, I think we're all on the same page with the commissioner because I, I, I'm not just looking at the beginning. I'm not looking at the benefit that it's going to be for somebody else to pocket their money, their pockets. But the end result, what I care about is to see is what's happening to our children. Right. Because what we're doing is we're creating a society and then we look back and we want to know, well, what happened? What happens is the things that we do and there are ongoing things and there are continual things and then we don't realize that those things have effect upon children. We're shaping them, and we're telling them that of their value. By the time they get grown, they don't have a value system. They don't care about nothing because nobody cares about them. And we create a society of people that have no value, have no sense of a of, 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 of purpose because of the things that we do. And education is highly important. What we do for these kids are very important because we are helping them become adults. And if we're shaping them badly, they're gonna be, we can't get good out of bad if we put bad in. There's just not enough in Jefferson City of that philosophy. We all do better when we all do better. There's too much of this, well, we'll have a voucher and then those people left behind, they're, that's, that's yeah. their own business. Yeah. I mean, we know the public education while we're so such a great country sure we, we brought right everybody in. Right. That is true. But the right people in. I, I, I would just like to add I got a direct line. One I more love. thing to something Rep. Uh, Senator Lovato said, and that she commented about the Speaker of the House. He is very invested in, in people and organizations inside the state that are uh, actively working to make the school system fail. There's no question about it. Make it fail? Uh -huh. Make it fail. They have a lot of money. They have an awful lot of money. And uh, he's right on board. Uh, I think before uh, we see a lot of successful direction in this thing, we're going to have to outlive the speaker. He's got one more year. Um, he's going to be followed in by uh, John Deal, who is now the floor leader. And I hope, I think, and I hope that we, we will see a lot more progressive movement out of Speaker Deal than we have out of Speaker Jones. Uh, Tim Jones, is uh, he has been devastated. Been I've devastating never, I've never seen a speaker who continually puts his own members in such bad votes. I know. You know, well, it's just, look it's, at 15, what he did to the 15. Yeah, it just, yeah. it's, I've never seen such a thing. But, uh, he's, you know, I might add, you know, I ran for state rep on the Republican side, and I can tell you first thing, I watched in caucus. And what they tell you is not an exaggeration. 
we have people in this state, not just politicians, but corporations, that have committed huge amounts of money to attack public education and teachers, teach retirement, right. and, and, they, and they're not going away. They're all going to spend whatever it takes. That's right. And it's the reality, and Jones is their superman, yeah, and right. they believe it. And he's trying to play that role. Right. But, and what's frustrating is, you know, the area reps, Tor B or Jeannie Lauer or um, just anyone you think of don't have that philosophy. So he's so much different from even his own party. But he keeps you know? everyone handcuffed. Yeah. I mean, he, he knows how to keep them up there. What is the lady's name? Is it Hanaway? Catherine Hanaway? Yeah. She's yes. going to run for governor. Yes, it's, and I hear she was very instrumental in Speaker Jones' uh, campaign. Hmm. And a bunch of I don't remember that name. She got a lot of them in office. She was a. She got them in office. She's a former Speaker of the House, first woman Speaker of the she House. Speaker she was Speaker when I came in. I don't remember Hanaway being anti-education. Yeah. Well, compared to Jones, no, she was not No, and I, I, I remember Kath, Catherine Hanaway or Rod Jetton, the speakers I served under, Steve Tilly, to a lesser extent, would not pursue something that was so devastating to the rest of the caucus. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Hey, no, I know what you're saying, you know? because he's almost like Dr. Hyde, you know. Yeah. He's yeah. just out of context. Yeah. Right. I mean, Hanaway is, was, and Jet too. I mean, he was reasonable and you could talk to him. Right. Not true of that, Joe. I mean, the hammer is, but. Uh, just give her a cigar. Jim Jones went out after this last year and was lost miserably. Uh, his own caucus beat him, and he wasn't happy about it. And now he has just one last shot, and uh, he's going to do his best to make it stick. So, by some stretch of the imagination, we can fend him off this time, then we win. But uh, he is committed to. So maybe that's another thing. If if I know to the north of here. Maybe. Representative Torpy is a Republican who I think is right on this issue, so we got to support him. Definitely. You know, when he makes his decisions during session. Maybe there not are during election, a lot of but, Republican you know I mean? educators who are doing the right thing. Yeah, I mean, if the Republican is going against the speaker, you got to support that person and say, thank you for caring more about your community than the party structure. Sure. Well, they should support anybody that does that. Which is why they couldn't override the veto. Right. right. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Round of applause. Thanks. Yeah, this is like being at home.